Thank you so much, Hervé, for that very kind introduction. And thank you all for being here, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Um, so today, uh, we've seen so many interesting uh, machine learning uh, methods being developed all week. It's been, it's been very exciting to be here. It's my first NeurIPS. Um, and in this specific workshop, we've seen a lot of interesting machine learning methods um, sort of within the domain of medical imaging. So today, I just want to spend the next um, 40 minutes kind of just having all of us sort of stand back and think about um, sort of the big picture together of, and, and sort of explore whether our machine learning methods are in fact solving a real clinical problem. So we'll sort of explore that together. And um, I'm going to focus on the problem of focal pathology or lesion or tumor segmentation and detection and disease prediction in patient images. And by way of introduction, that's my brain. <laughs> so um, we all know that um, machine learning has led to huge breakthroughs in the field of computer vision. So just a word about me, my background is computer vision. I did my master's and PhD in object recognition and I've worked on faces. So my lab does, uh, is a computer vision lab working um, now primarily on medical image analysis. So we know that they've had all these huge breakthroughs for a lot of problems. I don't have to tell you that with the advent of, of sophisticated machine learning methods, um, they have outperformed all the previous approaches by huge margins, and it's been a huge economic boom for, for startups, for large corporations. And um, of course, with the advent of these new methods, um, success has also been made possible because of the availability of large data sets and advances in hardware. Um, and so machine learning in the context of medical imaging has the potential to make huge advances in healthcare and medicine. Um, so assisting in things like patient diagnosis, um, understanding disease development, so this is a normal um, person and this is how them uh, having Alzheimer's. Um, so predicting patient outcome from images, so for example from this image determining survival, uh, when this person may pass away, survival time. Um, and other predictions, speeding up and making accurate clinical trials for new treatments. So for example, this is a responder, the tumor is in fact shrinking, and permitting advances in personal medicine, um, also called precision medicine, where what we'd like to do there is look at an image of a patient and be able to predict how that patient will do in the future. So for example, if they will, um, you know, and also how they will respond to a particular treatment. So we can convey this information to a clinician and then they can decide which treatment is the most appropriate. So this is great. We've had a lot of successful medical image analysis frameworks for segmentation, classification, prediction. We've heard a bunch of, of, of a bunch of them today. And of course, um, deep learning methods have been slower to adopt than the field of computer vision, as we all know. But and now, of course, they are beginning to be used more widely, and they've had huge success in a lot of uh, contexts. So we are in, a, in the MIC-high world, we are in a little bit of a, of a revolution. However, as was noted by some previous speakers, the resulting approaches have yet to be integrated fully into real clinical practice. So today I just want to explore some reasons why and just to look at a few challenges um, within this domain. So first it's important to note, so coming from the field of computer vision, that medical imaging does have a set of problems that are slightly different and slightly different needs than in computer vision. So deep learning approaches that worked really well in computer vision, um, sometimes they work well in medical imaging, but sometimes they don't work very well. And so the BRATS uh, challenge is a great example, as, uh, as Olaf had mentioned earlier. It's a great example where um, deep learning has been hugely successful. Um, brain tumor segmentation, all the, the winners have been sort of machine learning, deep learning methods. But they tried to do some sort of survival time prediction and that didn't work out so well. So these are techniques, for example, that may have worked well in computer vision, but it didn't work out so well. In this, uh, in this context. So as a result, um, this is good news because this provides opportunities for new machine learning models to be developed for some of our most challenging problems within medical imaging. But of course, um, if we give this to a clinician uh, where the method works sort of well or works well in some cases, um, errors in performance leads to some clinician uh, mistrust. So this, this has to be thought about. Um, furthermore, Often in computer vision, we're not so concerned with how the system attains its result as long as it's accurate. So, you know, here's a cat, and if we have almost 100% accuracy in recognizing the cat, we're pretty happy about that, but whether it was the side of the nose that did it or a part of the ear, we may be less interested. 
But um, clinicians have uh, slightly different needs. So this is, in fact, uh, this is from a talk from Dr. McGinty. She gave a great keynote at Mikhai this year. She's the chair of the American College of Radiology. And one of the things that she said, which I'm putting up here, is that a challenge to radiologists embracing AI in practice is that we don't really understand how AI arrives at a particular conclusion. And so she went on to say that inter interpretability is incredibly important um, in order for radiologists to integrate these methods into, into their pipeline. And so um, that's something that we need to think about as we move forward with our methods. And finally, as we've seen, of course, in this conference, that machine learning methods are, are often developed in computer science or engineering labs, where, where we often don't have access to huge annotated data sets for training. And also, we don't always have access to clinicians, um, and certainly not clinicians on a regular basis as we develop our methods, um, to help us figure out what we should be focusing on. So as a result, a lot of the frameworks are built in, in, on smaller proprietary data sets or on these sort of challenge or benchmark data sets, which is great because it gives everybody access to the same um, sort of data set and benchmarks. But sometimes uh, both of these lead to a lack of robustness to patient and data variability across different centers and different scanners and so on, which was touched upon today. And furthermore, in terms of the benchmarking data sets, like the challenges we have at some of our conferences, a lot of times people are fine-tuning their methods for established metrics, um, so everyone trying to sort of win the challenge and do well. Um, but the metrics might not be important for the clinical task of interest. So that's something I want us to just sort of explore together. So in this talk, I'm going to look at specifically at machine learning um, performance and metrics for success for medical image analysis in a real clinical context. And I'm going to talk about analyzing patient images where there are multiple focal pathologies. So this, uh, this sort of is lesions, it could be tumors, it could be anything like that. And I'm going to focus on a problem that we've been working on, a context that we've been working on for many years, and that's of multiple sclerosis. So I'll talk a little bit about multiple sclerosis lesion detection and segmentation, and I'll tell you a little bit about what the clinical objectives are in the context of clinical trial analysis, and sort of some of the challenges that we have seen with performance of popular machine learning methods and um, established metrics of success in this domain. And I'll, I'll, I'll help, we'll, we'll work out together some several possible metrics of relevance. Uh, I'll also talk about including uncertainty uh, and some recent work that we've looked at, uh, including uncertainty measures for deep learning for lesion detection and segmentation. And if there's time, I'll talk to you a little bit about prediction of future disease activity and disability pro progression. So we have had, um, this is the context, a very long, long-term collaboration with an industrial partner, NeurRx. This is a local company, a spin-off from the Montreal Neurological Institute. And they provide the software analysis to pharmaceutical industry for almost all the MS clinical trials for new drugs in the world. So they've given us a lot of data. Um, I say 10,000, but you know, it, it, it's somewhere in the, above that from different active trials, from different global centers, from different scanner technologies. And for every one of them, we have multiple MRI modalities, for example, T1, T2, PD, FLARE, T1C. Uh, we have different time points, so we have patients over time. And much more importantly, we have um, access to expert labels. Um, and these labels are, are from trained experts who sit at NeuroX all day. Uh, they've been trained for many, many months uh, to do things like lesion detection and segmentation, many of which are neuroradiologists. So this is just, I'll get back to that picture. These are MS patients over time, and these are different slices and different modalities. So I think my sort of message just before I even begin is that through interdisciplinary co collaborations with the companies, giving us data and expertise, and also from the point of view of the end user, and neurologists, neuroradiologists, and researchers at the Montreal Neurological Institute, we've developed machine learning methods to automate and improve the analysis of real brain patient um, data in the context of clinical trials collected from data collected all over the world. And so the idea here is that um, we, our work has had, in fact, um, clinical impact. And it's through these, um, the synergy that we've made and through the fact that we've developed our methods and our metrics with, with the clinical objectives in mind that we have had clinical impact in the context of lesion and uh, detection and segmentation. So our algorithms have been placed into their commercial software pipeline 
And um, yes, we have led to improved efficiency and precision. We're replacing um, humans in many of the tasks and led them to a lot of savings in time and money. But much more importantly, almost all the new MS drugs in circulation in the world have been, um, have been analyzed using our methods. So I'm, I'm just going to skip a little bit. So the, the main message here is synergy with clinicians and users when designing the method, plus tying the methods and the metrics for success to real clinical objectives equals clinical impact. So, sorry, there's a duplication there. So let's talk a little bit about um, segmentation. Segmentation is one of the main areas of research in medical image analysis. It's important for many, many domains. And segmentation can be defined in sort of a number of ways, if you'll see in papers, either delineating the boundary between classes, for example, white matter and gray matter, or labeling every single voxel as being a member of a class, um, let's say, tumor or non-tumor. There are many uh, benchmarking data sets, for example, MCHI challenges, and that's great, again, so people can compare their methods, um, and also to, vi to basically de um, permit sort of uh, a fair uh, comparison for everybody. So that really defines the standard for, quantifi for quantifying the performance of your algorithm, not just against ground truth, but also against other methods. Um, and so let's just look at the segmentation metrics because the segmentation metrics for many of the Mikai challenges are really adopted from the field of computer vision. So what is different about the com field of computer vision? Computer vision, here are some uh, data sets for, used for segmentation. Um, usually the objects are in some sort of pronounced um, region of interest. Um, so for example, you can see the, the, the bird up on the top. Um, and you basically would like to label or segment either objects from the background or an instance segmentation. You would basically want to find the, the different objects in the scene. So in this case, it's slightly different. Um, you have this pronounced region of interest. So you know what you're looking it's sort of in that region. There's no real um, huge amount of uncertainty about ground truth, except for often of the boundaries. So. Um, the metrics that people use for success in automatic techniques for computer vision are really these two categories. Okay, the first is voxel-based overlap methods. This could be DICE or Jacquard. Really the voxel-based agreement between an expert and an automatic method. And sometimes, of course, you get these ROC curves. Look at it on a voxel-based ROC curve, which is true positive rate versus false positive rate, which are defined here for all the voxels in your, in your scene. The second one is boundary-based methods. So these are look at how far segmentation deviates from the object boundary. And so both of these are, in fact, global and voxel-based methods. And in fact, um, they dominate the evaluation methods for a lot of our benchmarks in medical image segmentation. So again, if that's true, uh, are these, in fact, appropriate? What problems are they appropriate for? So it's true that when you look at sort of healthy structure segmentation, the hippocampus, here's an example of the ventricles. If you have uh, a structure that you know is in your brain, for example, you can have a pronounced region of interest, zoom in on that area, and use these voxel-based or these global-based methods. And similarly, for lar a single large pathology, like a tumor, um, these methods could be very appropriate as well. But what I'm going to be focusing about in my talk is that there are a lot of domains where you have multiple local pathologies in the image. And this could be, these are examples from sort of breast cancer, where you have small enhancements. And you can have, um, you know, it, within the brain, I'll talk a little bit about um, other problems, where you have all of these focal pathologies. And um, you would like to find them in order to diagnose, for example, the patient. You would like to know, for example, how the patient is doing under treatment, if it's a, if it's a cancer patient. So the, the tasks are twofold in this context. First, you want to detect. Okay? You want to find all these structures of interest. You want to find, for example, in this enhanced breast image, all of the structures of interest. And then you would like to potentially segment or delineate boundaries. So it, you can see already this is a slightly different set of clinical objectives. And both of them are really hard. So for detection, often you can see here, we don't know how many there are. There could be one. There could be 50. Um, often they look like other structures. For example, if an enhancement image, you can have other things enhancing in the image. They're hard to find. You can't really have any priors. And then if you'd like to segment them, they often look very much um, similar to other structures and similar to background. So I just want to look at with you, are these segmentation metrics appropriate for these contexts? So in order to do that, let's just zoom in a little bit on MS. So MS is the most common neurological disorder affecting young adults. It's per particularly important in Canada. We have the highest percentage per capita of MS in the world. 
Um, and it's when you're, the patient's own immune system attacks the brain, leading to disabilities. And one of the hallmarks of MS is the appearance of these brain lesions, which are visible on MRI. This is bright on T2. So T2 volume has been used to estimate what we call the burden of disease, like how much disease you have, um, the stage, and activity. Um, so the most common form is what we call relapsing remitting. Relapsing remitting is when you have intermittent attacks and relapses over time, followed by full or partial recovery. And so you can see here, um, if you look at the images over time, you will see that also lesions appear and disappear. Um, and, and you can see that there's a dynamic aspect to it. There are lesions, newer lesions, and there are also stable lesions that don't disappear over time. And so they can either grow or shrink, or disappear, or be stable. There is no cure for MS. There are treatments available which mitigate the symptoms. In order to have um, new treatments, we need clinical trials. And so the point that I'm trying to make now is for clinical trials, we need a wider set of metrics to determine the burden of disease or activity in order to determine treatment efficacy. So for example, we would like to know the number and the, and, and the lesion volume of T2 lesions in MRI. We also want to count the number of new lesions, the new T2 and longitudinal MRI, and also the number of gadolinium-enhanced lesions in T1. So the gadolinium-enhanced lesions are when you inject the patient with a contrast agent and you see new bright enhancements in the image and you'd like to find them. So these last ones are actually, these determine whether the treatment is working. If you have a patient and they have these new lesions, that says something about the treatment not working. So it talks a lot also if you don't have patients on, on a drug, it tells you about the worsening of the disease for that patient. So for this particular problem, um, it's often done clinically manually or semi-manually, uh, which is expensive, inconsistent, and very, very slow. So we need automatic approaches to detect and segment lesions. And as was stated from uh, a big uh, survey paper, the detection or finding them all is much more important than delineating all of the boundaries. In addition, we need to be consistent over time. It's incredibly important if you want to know if your treatment is working, we need to have this consistency over time. And we need to be robust to different trials, different scanners and centers, and also different disease stage. So again, we have all of these metrics. Um, I'm not going to talk about all of them. These last two, we've done incredible amounts of work, almost 15 years of work, and these are some of the uh, papers that have come out of that. Uh, out of that work in terms of, um, and this one is a Bayesian approach, which looks at lesions over time, and um, we had a lot of work on a conditional random field approach to find GAD lesions. But today I just want to talk so that we can explore together this sort of T2 lesion detection and segmentation, because this is the problem that a lot of the field is working on. So MS lesions, as you can see, these are a lot of patients, and red are the lesions. MS lesions um, vary substantially in terms of their appearance, in terms of the location, in terms of their shape. Um, you can have very small ones. Many of them in clinical trials are very small, and I mean three voxels, uh, up to 100 voxels. And uh, we can have different lesion loads. We can have one lesion. We can have 100 lesions in the brain. And so this is one example just showing um, that type of variability, and these are patients from the clinical trial, so you can get that idea. So over time, um, so we developed uh, many different methods. I won't describe them, the, them here, but we've developed recently uh, a, a unit to segment T2 lesions in MRI. And so this is a paper um, that we presented at Mikai at a workshop. This is just part of a, a, of a different um, paper, which I'll get to after. So we had this great unit, it had uh, multiple inputs, and we had uh, lesion labels as the output, and um, we had a, a clinical trial, which was uh, over 1,000 patients acquired from different centers and different scanners, and we divided the chaining set and testing validation set that way. So the idea is, um, how do we figure out if how well it's performing? This is the question that I sort of want to explore with you. So if you look at a lot of the grand challenges, and there are a number of them, there's a MICI challenge from 2008 that is an MS lesion segmentation challenge, there's an ISB one and a more recent MICI one. And evaluation of new algorithms typically relies on these traditional metrics. So for example, for white matter hyperintensity, we still look at DICE, Hausdorff, and other things. Here's the MRS brains uh, where we look at um, uh, these types of metrics. So, all of the people working on this area who, who want to come into MS lesion segmentation are relying both on the data and the ground truth and the metrics for success that I've just named. 
And so I want to just explore with you um, the performance of the methods based on these traditional metrics. So here's an example. Let's look at dice for a moment. Um, so here are the ground truth lesions in one particular example. I don't know how well you can see it, but you can basically say there are 76 lesions in this person's brain. A large number of them are big, over 50 voxels, I mean 11, and then there's 26 medium, but there's 39 small ones, meaning more than half of the lesions are small. So the question I tried to look at is, okay, let's, let's look at dice for a moment. Um, and so we get a dice of 0.75 for this particular case. Um, you can see in yellow, I don't know if you can see where you are, um, the false positives and in red the false negatives, and it does pretty well. So if we actually look at um, sort of the, the, tech, the, the ROC curves that people would use for voxel-based methods in computer vision, it would be true positive rate over false positive rate, and you would get something like this. So of course, if you look at this, uh, typically in computer vision, if you have a pronounced region of interest around the thing you're trying to segment, you would typically have a, a true negative at the bottom, which for lesions means um, that it, that dom denominator would sort of dominate, um, and, and that would not be the right metric. So, because lesions take up a very small percentage of the brain. And so, then you can have a different kind of metric which looks at the false detection rate. This is, again, voxel-based, and you would then have the false detection rate, which would have two positives at the bottom, and it would look something like this, which is great. So, if you look at this curve, it's still performing quite well. So the question we want to ask ourselves is, what if we remove all of the detected lesions, all the small ones? So meaning our method doesn't find any small lesions. So we can see here that the dice, in fact, is 0.72. So if you look at dice as a metric for a voxel-based technique, um, this actually has no change. Even though I'm trying to find all, the, all of the lesions, I've missed all of the small ones, and uh, DICE doesn't change very much, which is problematic for um, tr clinical trials. And if you look at our curve, our curve, this is the curve with all of the lesions. Our curve goes down slightly, but still um, does not show any uh, problem, uh, any huge problem with, this, with these errors. So uh, sort of the take-home message so far is that looking at these global-based measures um, really limits our ability to fully assess the workings of the algorithm and differentiate different performance and really impedes our ability to develop methods that are useful for this context, which is clinical trials. So we really want to look at lesion detection metrics, and we want to detect them all. And so we have detection metrics, which are basically overlap metrics. If your lesion, in fact, uh, overlaps by over 50%, or if it's small three voxels, then we'll say it's a true positive, and it's a false positive if you have less than three voxels in overlap. And so now let's look at detection in computer vision, because now it's a detection task, and see what the ROC curve would be like. So here's a detection task in computer vision. This is pedestrian detection, this is face detection, and you can see once again you have a bounding box, there are instance-based segmentations which actually get the, the voxels, but you have a pronounced region of interest again and you have these big areas and you're trying to find things in the image. So here's a comparison of, different, of an ROC curve again from pedestrian detection algorithms that's out there. And you can see here that, um, again, they use FPR, which means there's true negatives. So again, if you have big bounding boxes and you're looking for pedestrians, you can have true negatives. They're basically where they don't overlap with the bounding box of ground truth. But in our case, I don't know what a lesion-based tr true negative would be. So we go back to our false detection rate, and here's what we find. So this is segmentation, this is a voxel-based method, with and without, this is, this is no small lesion. And here we have detection at the lesion level where we can now see a significant drop in performance when small lesions are missed and in this one case. So that's great, it's showing you that you didn't find a lot of them and, and it's perfect. So that's the sort of method, that's for that particular case. So let's look at the overall uh, clinical trial data set. And so in blue, you have the voxel level results, and in green, you have the lesion level results. And in fact, if you look at, I don't know, 0.2, it's actually working quite well in terms of the, the entire data set. So we can say the method is accurate and robust and works across this multi-center, multi-scanner um, trial provided by our sponsor. So does this tell the whole story? So one thing that we can see is if we look at our results and we actually chop it up according to size, so we have voxel level results in blue, but up here are all the big lesions. 
Um, this is the result that I showed earlier, and here you have what small lesions. And in this case, again, small lesions make up 40% of this clinical trial. So don't forget, in clinical trials, we're interested in knowing um, even early on if a patient has one new lesion or one lesion data set, it's incredibly important to find it. And so these lesions are 3 to 10 voxels in size, so this gives us um, a sensitivity of 0.4 at this operating range. So again, the average here is here, but we still are not finding our small lesions. So I just wanted to show you an earlier sort of non-deep learning method. Um, so earlier we developed a probabilistic Markov random field variant, an iterative hierarchical graphical model to detect and segment T2 lesions. I won't get into the details, but the idea of the method um, is that you have multiple inputs of MRI, you have a voxel-based approach, which really tries to be very generous in finding lesion voxels, grouping the, the lesion voxels into lesion candidates, and then a non-lattice-based MRF, um, of which we've talked a little bit about earlier in, this, in the day. Um, but here we have a non-lattice-based MRF, which kind of looks at the spatial orientation, relationships to other structures, and something about each region, and it iterates through that. So our, um, here we tried to look at, for example, we had training and testing in completely different trials. So our training trials had 1,000 patients at 1.5T and another set with 3T. And testing, we tested it on two other different trials. So each one of these tests, just to say when I say trials, this trial had 500 patients, but it was from 128 different centers, okay? So they're not from the same centers. So here we divide our results, and this is just showing our hierarchical MRF versus some other MRFs, some of them in the literature. These are the medium-sized lesions, or, or the, uh, the bigger ones, they all perform the same, but if we actually chop it up into two different groups, where here's the lesions of three to 10 voxels in size, we can see that our approach actually performs quite well. So in this case, we can see the importance of actually chopping up our results and really looking at size separately to see how well our method compares to others. So um, again, we need to tailor our metrics to the clinical um, uh, context of interest. So what about segmentation? So a lot of times people are saying, okay, fine, you've detected the lesions. That's great, even if you did it perfectly. Can you then apply voxel-based or, sur or surface-based metrics to see how well you've segmented each one of these lesions that you've detected? And so we want to then look back and explore um, if we can actually get accurate segmentation results for the detected lesions. And in order to do this, we need to look at ground truth. And I think this is something that we all need to just remember about medical imaging, specifically about pathology segmentation, is ground truth really should be put in quotations. Um, they, these are results for small, medium, and large lesions in patient images from the clinical trial. And in red are the results of these trained, sometimes neuroradiologists, sometimes expert doctors to, who sit there all day long doing it. And here are sort of the results that you can see. So the first thing I just want to show you, even for the large lesions, the expert does not delineate the boundaries uh, often, and not very well either, because there is no known ground truth in those areas, and they weren't sure what to do. Um, and there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty, not just in the lesion boundaries, but also for the small lesions. They count, they find the lesions, but they don't really know how to um, delineate those boundaries. And so this is what ground truth is in this context, and these are our experts. So let's just zoom in a little bit. Here's a, a periventricular lesion, meaning here's the ventricle. The tip, this is a zoom in of that image. And let's just look at one of these small lesions for a moment. Okay, so this is an eight voxel lesion. And, um, we, and when we have ground truth, this is basically what we get. So if we actually get this result for segmentation, you get a dice of one. Um, and here's an example of what happens when you start to miss lesions. So the yellow are missed voxels and the green are false positives. So you start to have errors. And you can see the, how sensitive these small lesions are to these small errors. Dice goes for 1, 0 0.92, 0 0.83, all the way to 0 0.7. Um, and so the thing that I want to just state is, given that we have uncertainties in the ground truth, even if we get a dice of 1, even if we uh, do, like rank first in some sort of challenge where we are the winner and we get perfect results, we know that the ground truth is imperfect. So we need to keep that in mind. And if we actually rank all of these methods in accordance to these dice metrics um, at some sort of challenge, does, does this actually make sense? In other words, is there any clinical problem out there where getting one voxel more or one voxel less 
matters clinically and if there isn't um, we have to understand that sort of as a field all of the people are trying to get a machine learning algorithm that would actually um, let's say outperform this method and move up in the ranking. It's very hard, I might just add, to publish a segmentation paper without stating how you ranked on one of these public data sets if you're working on this problem. So again, ranking of methods in medical imaging challenges or competitions should definitely be handled with care. It's very different from computer vision or Kegel challenges because of all of these issues. And just to point your uh, direction of, uh, of your attention to these two publications, we had, a pa we had a talk about challenge design and we just had a Nature paper accepted talking a lot about rankings in biomedical image analysis and, and how they should be handled with care. So this is great. Um, my, I guess my, my take home message is that DICE um, does not really uh, do it, in, especially for small lesions, uh, and, and we should keep that in mind. So this brings us to, to sort of the next thing that I wanted to discuss is that um, so some of the deep learning techniques work incredibly well for segmenting large pathologies and large structures, but again, we still have some challenges for small pathologies in general. And so um, handling, if we, if we showed a clinician results like this, where these are the correct lesions and we have a lot of false positives and false negatives, um, the clinician would then start to sort of mistrust these results and maybe not want to adopt them in their clinical practice. And so this is some of the problem with sort of a deterministic output from our machine learning method. So this might lead to, for example, mistrust of the clinician. So um, what if we can actually then um, show the clinician itself, his or herself, um, the results in the form of uncertainty? And so this is some work that we're very, very interested in. And so our results can be in the form of sort of lesion, non-lesion, and this new uncertain class. So the, there would be sort of question marks. And so this would permit the clinician to then go back and review some of these results that they're uncertain about and decide, you know, are these really lesions or not? And this is great because instead of sort of removing the clinician from the process, we can then, you know, we can then integrate the clinician into the process and, 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 and show them results that, in fact, they would be happy to work with. Um, so this is some work that we presented, um, and this is how we, we build trust. So this is some work that we presented at Mikai this year. Um, my uh, student, um, I just wanted to say because she's here, um, got the Young Scientist Award based on this, this work. And this is where we sort of explored uncertainty measures in deep networks um, for the context of MS lesion detection and segmentation. So we developed um, a, a framework to produce different uncertainty measures uh, in segmentation and detection of these focal pathologies and the context of deep networks. So we had, you know, multimodal MRI, and we had a 3D uh, deep learning segmentation network, and we produced both voxel level and lesion level results. And also we explored four different uh, uncertainty measures for each one of these. So I'll just talk about it now. Um, so our network is a variant of the UNET, and the idea is, I'm just going to go a little bit faster, <laughs> is that the idea is, um, is that we have an input and instead of um, using simply, instead of having one deterministic output, we use dropout uh, based on the, the Kendall and the Gall papers. And we had dropout during training and then during testing we got several samples of the segmentation results for which we got, um, we have both the output is the mean basically of all of the segmentation results and it permitted us to have four different kinds of uncertainties, the predicted variance, and, um, uh, and the three derived measures, so for those of you that obviously are familiar with that paper, um, the sample variance, the entropy, and the mutual information, which are depicted here. And we just sort of wanted to see how well they perform in terms of modeling the uncertainty in this case. So this is at the voxel level, and then um, in order to get uncertainty in the lesion level, um, I, basically what we did is we merged the uncertainty at the voxel level using a naive Bayes assumption. So basically kind of conditional independence of all of these uncertainties to then for every lesion we had a, a, an, and, and also healthy tissue, we had an, a sort of uncertainty associated with, with the voxels and the lesions. So we had experiments where we had this trial. It's, uh, again, the same trial. We had multiple inputs. 
we had ground truth T2 lesions, which were basically a correction of, um, by a manual uh, expert of an automatic technique that's an in-house thing. We had, um, this is how the training, validation, and test scans were divided. So again, we had this many patients, but we had more than one time point. And we basically looked at both voxel level performance and lesion level detection. And we evaluated the true positive rate and false detection curves for different uncertainty thresholds, which I'll explain in a moment. So here we have, the, just to show you, this is the result. This is the segmentation over T2. And in red is a false positive. So here are the different uncertainty measures. The predicted variance, which tends to tell you something about the noise, um, looks very different from the sort of model-based uncertainty that, the, that is produced from the Monte Carlo samples. I don't know how well you can see it, but they don't actually vary all that much. They have slightly different sort of performances at, at the voxel level, but overall they, sim have, they have similar patterns of uncertainty. And what we found is that if you zoom in, um, the false positives are in fact more uncertain. And furthermore, if you zoom in at the false positives, and in fact for all of the lesions, and you will see that the contours are in fact much more uncertain. And again, you can see the differences between these approaches. Predicted variance is completely different. But you can see that it's still the boundaries that are quite uncertain. Furthermore, if you look at the lesion level uncertainties, I don't know if you can see it, but we have, I'm zooming in, we have small lesions here, okay, and the green are the true positives, the red false positives, and the blue false negatives. And in fact, all of these three um, show that um, the, the small lesions are much more uncertain. So what we then decided to look at is, are our incorrect predictions, do they have higher uncertainty? Because that's very interesting and important where I'm unsure um, and, and the, the correlation between wrong and being unsure is actually, is it very strong? And, and that we looked at um, by saying, for example, we're going to filter out the uncertain predictions and that should increase the performance on the remaining certain predictions. So we wanted to see if that were true. So for example here, we have baseline, meaning there's no filtering here, and here you have a false positive. Um, and then as, at a certain uncertainty threshold, you would therefore have, uh, if this were very uncertain and these were certain, it would remove the false positive and bring it into the uncertain class. And so we ran a bunch of experiments, and the idea behind the experiments is to look at different uncertainty thresholds. Baseline means that I have no uncertainty threshold. And then we, we decrease the uncertainty threshold, meaning what's left is more of what I'm sure about. And in brackets here are the number of lesions that remain. So, okay, so you can see from 98 down. And so what we noticed is that as we decrease our uncertainty threshold, the area under the curve, it's just the trend that you should see, increases, suggesting that uncertain lesions are also incorrectly detected. They are our false positives and our false negatives. Um, and that's true even for when removing 2%, we have a, a jump in performance. So again, um, because we were interested in sort of this whole notion of size, so here are the small lesions and here are the medium lesions and here's the same experiment. And if we zoom in, we can see that a lot of the winnings that we have are in the small lesion area, meaning a lot of the small lesions were incorrect and 40%, I guess, again, of the clinical trial data are, have small lesions. So we have 40% of the lesions are small. And so you can see that we have the biggest sort of gain in, in the small lesion area where we are incorrect a lot of the time. And the medium lesions are, are, have less of a gain because we're, we tend to be right. So I'm just going to go on. So uncertainty derived from Monte Carlo dropout as does actually correspond to incorrect predictions and allows the clinicians here, by, by giving them the uncertainty, the clinicians and the radiologists can then focus on reviewing these most uncertain predictions. And so I just want to spend just, just two more minutes um, uh, just talking to you about some recent work that we're doing. It's a lot of different students who are in the lab working on this, and that's sort of a, a focus right now in our lab. Um, and so what we're really interested now is sort of, can we actually pre predict future MRI lesion activity? So for example, new lesions in the future, or enlarged lesions, lesion growth based on baseline MRI. 
So if we can do this, then we can really understand things like how the disease, how patients naturally worsen over time. What is the disease manifestation? And also the prediction of treatment effects. So that would be helpful to have potentially figure out who might be a responder. And also this helps us choose treatment. So if you know that this person, for example, will be doing terribly two years from now, you may be giving them a much riskier drug. That might be something that you think of. So what do we mean by active or inactive? I'm not sure if you can see this. It's a little bit hard. But a patient, here's baseline and two years later. So a patient that has no changes in their lesions is called an inactive patient. And an active patient has either new growth um, or new lesions, and actually um, we also look at gadolinium enhancement if they have new enhancement. So here again, um, this is some work we, we did at the, at the Brainless workshop this year. So we basically had a, a, a network that basically predicted this binary output. Is the person in the future going to have disease activity or not? based on their images that they've inputted and also based on the labels that we had at baseline, so at that first time point. And so um, one of the things that we so showed is that MRI alone, if you look here at the ROC curves, MRI alone is in blue and it doesn't work very well. We cannot predict future uh, disease from MRI alone. But once we added in the, the lesion maps at baseline, we actually performed really well. And so that's very interesting because if you look here at some qualitative results, these are patients that we did well in. So this is patients that we correctly stated were inactive or active, and this is baseline in two years later. So you can see here that it, it, we don't really understand why or what lesion manifestation, the physicians don't either, um, what different sort of, sort of uh, arrangement of lesions or numbers of lesions will cause somebody to be inactive years later or to be active. You can have no lesions and then two years later have 50 or you can have, no, you can have one lesion somewhere and then um, have one years later. And so it's, it's, it's the network that's picking that up. So of course we want to know what if we didn't have ground truth lesions at baseline. So we brought back our unit and we actually predicted those um, labels and we put it into our network. And so what we found here is in green, we still did pretty well at predicting, even with, um, without ground truth, with the predicted labels. We had a slight um, sort of, it slightly went down in terms of performance, but um, I think that that's also due to the small lesions, which we still need to work on. We also use dropout here. So we use dropout in training, and we also use the dropout during test time to get the uncertainty in the activity prediction. And this is really important because then we could tell the clinician, for example, I think this patient is going to do terribly, and I have very high confidence in that output, or I really don't know what will happen to this patient. And so um, one of the things that we're also looking at is then interpretability. Okay, so image-based biomarkers. And, and so one of the things that we've started to explore is sort of if we are sure that this person will be active or inactive in the future, what was the network looking at? So we're, these are what the clinicians are interested in. What were they looking at? So we had a grad cam approach, which is just something that we were trying in the lab, which um, will basically help us look at the activation map for predicting future lesion activity. Again, we only looked at it when we were sure. So if this person were sure is going to be active in the future, what was the network looking at? Okay, so it has to be correct and with high confidence. And so we got these sort of grad cam results at different scales. This is a definite work in, practice, in progress, and I, I don't actually think the grad cam at the moment is, is the most helpful way of doing interpretability at this point, but we're still working on other things. And so finally, um, we, are, we've, we are actually part of a huge um, sort of, uh, consortium of labs that are building uh, the first um, sort of database, a huge database of progressive MS patient uh, images. And progressive MS is, a, is basically a kind of MS where you don't necessarily have new lesions, but you're just, um, your disability gets worse over time. There's only one treatment starting to work, and it was out this year by Roche. This is not a well-understood sort of subtype of the disease, and we have this huge grant that we've put together where we're getting 40,000 patients over time from hospitals around the world, and all the large phase three clinical trials in progressive MS. And so why that's interesting is we'd like to be able to predict from baseline images how this patient will do in terms of, in terms of disability, okay, in terms of how their, their, those outcomes will be based simply on baseline images and whatever information we have at the first time point. It could be lesion labels and so on. So we've developed the first end-to-end -end deep learning model to do this, and Adrian, my student, will actually be presenting that shortly, so I won't say any more about that. But the importance of that is, as you can see, we don't have treatments, so we can do, use this to assist in early phase 
uh, trials to facilitate drug discovery. So in conclusion, I guess my, my take home message is that there's huge potential for machine learning and deep learning to revolutionize medicine and healthcare. These new problems and new challenges are actually opportunities for all of us. So we need to really develop new methods for particular problems of the field. But for clinical impact, we really need to work with the clinicians and the end users, which in this case is both, because I'm working with a company. Uh, when designing the method, but also we need to tie the method and the metrics to the success of the, in terms of the real clinical objectives. So otherwise, all of these people, uh, all of, all of, everyone's trying to win challenges and publish papers and everyone's working so hard to get these sophisticated methods, but again, if they're not of interest to clinicians, um, they won't be solving these problems, and that's really the main objective of the field of, of medical image analysis. So again, what, I, what my goals are for all of my frameworks, automatic lesion analysis to speed up and improve drug development or predicting. I'm really interested in precision medicine and, um, and to help understand the disease course um, for progressive MS. So I'd like to thank um, my students who do all the work uh, and my <laughs> granting agencies. And this is a collaborative work with, a lot of it was with Doina Precup and um, Doug Arnold and Louis Collins from the MNI. So thank you.